So what this meant was when I looked at that thing and saw the median apothesis, it was so beautiful to me because I knew what it meant. It meant to me that I had found something that was on a very distinctive branch. We'd never seen anything like it before. And it had the promise, possibly, of telling us things about the evolution of the visual system and so forth. Now, of course, to do that, to study that, we're going to have to go back to Papua New Guinea, get more live ones, do them, study them in the right way to understand about visual systems and so forth. But at least there was a possibility. When I was struggling trying to explain this to my colleagues, I actually had an epiphany. Uh, uh, and the epiphany was about 20th century music. Because there's a lot of 20th century music that I cannot figure out how people think is beautiful. I'm sorry, I just can't, right? And, and as I was struggling to explain this to my, to my colleagues there, I realized, you know, now I appreciate people who like 20th century music. Because it must be that they know things that I simply don't know. Because of course I don't know uh, much about uh, uh, what's behind a lot of the 20th century music. And were I to have that knowledge, I would find it beautiful also. And so I really do think that in many ways, the more we know, the more we find beautiful. Um, there's some beauty, though, in these spiders that I think, at least, is plain for all to see. Some pretty amazing colors and interesting forms and so forth. And we really do share the tree of life with some pretty incredible jewels. Um, I just want to show you uh, a couple of them live. This is one of the ones that looks like an ant. Uh, it's waving around its first legs as if they were antennae. This is one that looks like a, a beetle. It's actually a jumping spider. This is one that looks like a bit of debris. Uh, possibly a bird dropping, it's hard to tell. It, it walks in a very jerky way. Uh, this one, I don't know what it looks like, but it doesn't look much like a jumping spider. These are the Hewa talking in the background, by the way. Looking up at us. This is another one looking up at us uh, and looking frantic. Um, so, that was the most uh, heart-pounding, um, uh, adrenaline-pumping moment and why it mattered to me. Um, but I want to say that, of course, there were many other memorable moments on this trip. Uh, this is one of the elders of the Hewa talking to the mammologist about bats. And so there were a lot of conversations that I couldn't follow uh, that were in pigeon. He, uh, Chris Helgen knows pigeon that had to do with what mammals were in the forest uh, because we weren't able to see a lot of them. Uh, but the Hewa knew about uh, most of them. This is the uh, vine bridge, uh, suspension bridge that uh, that same village elder had built several decades before. Perfectly good condition. It wasn't scary at all going across it. Uh, I discovered uh, uh, the joys of eating raw peanuts, which I'd never done before, straight out of the shell. Uh, I discovered, for instance, that they actually really are like their legumes. I mean, you don't sort of appreciate the weird little ones with two things that we get, but they even taste a little bit like peas. Uh, uh, some of the beautiful areas, the sites, uh, this is a tree fern savanna. Uh, these aren't palms, these are ferns. A tree fern savanna at 3,000 meters elevation. A beautiful mossy forest at 3,300 meters, uh, actually rather cold. Um, I, I remember the day when I met these people very well. These, this is in the Suyan village. Um, uh, Saike is holding up uh, a vial there. Uh, this is where we found uh, Yamangalea Fawana and uh, Tabuina Rufa. In fact, uh, Pingisa at the right there got so into helping me collect that he just grabbed my beating sheet from me uh, and started going at it on his own. And luckily I had a backup to, to, <laughs> to continue myself. But he and I are the only two people I know of ever to have collected Tabuina Rufa. And it was a really special and important day for me. So th this, was, this was a wonderful time. Uh, the, the great market at Garoka. Uh, of course, there are other sorts of memories, like uh, waiting for the fog to lift in uh, uh, Porgueras, the, uh, watching B-movies, and we had a lot of uh, uh, chuckles about some of the B-loop movies we learned about. Uh, so it was just an amazing trip in terms of so many memories. And of course, you can imagine there's a whole lot I'm not showing. I want to end the talk on a section that I call Time Machine. Uh, and it'll become clear eventually why it's named that. But I want to start off just saying that we estimate about 50 species of spiders new to science were found. Uh, it's going to take us a while to go through the material to, to, to really uh, nail this down and do the full descriptions. Um, we call them new species, even though it doesn't mean that they recently evolved or anything. It just means they're new for us. Uh, and so all of these, for instance, are, are, are new species. Uh, because of their placement on the evolutionary tree, uh, 
we expect that somewhere between 17 to 15 of these will be distinctive enough to be new genera, and these are some of them there. We, we can't place them into a known genus at all. Um, there were some things found, of course, other than spiders. I told my side of the story. Uh, um, no new mammals or birds, uh, but uh, some new species of frogs and lizards, and some new plants. So I want to say why, talk about why we should discover new species. It's fun, right? We find new things, it's great. Uh, it makes a lot of press, apparently. Uh, um, one of the reasons that we want to find new species uh, is to have a complete view of what evolution can produce and has produced. If we're going to try to understand something like evolution, we'd like to know its complete products to be able to understand fully uh, uh, what its output has been, because that's going to help us infer how it works. Uh, from the ecological point of view, we'd like to know what are the actors in Earth's ecosystems. Without knowing the pieces, it's a little hard to know how the puzzle fits together uh, uh, and, and functions. I mentioned the, the, the issue of the eye, and that's certainly true in general, that uh, the more species we have, the more opportunities we have to discover solutions to nature's problems that we might also share. So I show this one because it's my only picture of a jumping spider that shows the fangs open and a drop of venom on one of the fangs. So uh, right there is a drop of venom. I've been bitten twice in my life, 40, almost 38 years, uh, uh, working with jumping spiders twice. Uh, and both times it's been less, much less painful than a bee sting. Um, but the venom of spiders is something that's evolved to uh, subdue insects. Uh, often its method of action is uh, neurological. It, it affects the nervous system. We can find. Uh, possible uses ourselves in anything, any chemicals that can affect the nervous system, and especially something that's been tried out uh, for many millions of years. The different species have slightly different venoms. So in fact, there are people prospecting in spiders for, uh, uh, for chemicals that might have neuropharmacological effect that could be of interest. We don't know if this is going to come have anything to do with jumping spiders, but in spiders in general, there's interest in this. Uh, finally, uh, uh, it's really interesting simply to have a map so we know for any future purpose what is our map of biodiversity. Right now it's estimated that there are about 2 million species we have described. It's also estimated that there are between 5 and 30 million species out there. Uh, so we know somewhere between a half and a tenth of the species on Earth. If you were to think about the sort of map we could not now draw about bio of biodiversity, it would resemble the maps of the uh, uh, early 16th century, such as this, uh, of the Earth, where there's vast areas of terra incognita, more or less. We're effectively at this point, and it's rather surprising, I think, to many people to realize that we are so, we have so little knowledge of biodiversity, given the fact that Google Earth can zoom in and find somebody sunbathing on the roof of a building. Uh, um, but we're a long way from finding all the species on Earth. So the great age of biodiversity discovery that many people think uh, ended about a century ago, in fact, continues. There's an awful lot left to do. So, okay, so now why do I call this section Time Machine? Uh, this is a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon of him going back in his cardboard box time machine uh, to take photos of, uh, partly to take photos of dinosaurs so he can sell them for a lot, uh, but uh, clearly he's fascinated with dinosaurs. And I know I have daydreamed occasionally about wouldn't it be amazing to have a time machine to go back to see dinosaurs, or to go back to see what lived with dinosaurs, or to go back even further to see trilobites. And my bet is that there's at least a couple of you in the audience that have also had similar daydreams. But wouldn't it be amazing? Well, in 500 years, we will wish we had time machines to come back to now. Uh, we will see now, as the last days of the Garden of Eden, we will see now as the time when most of the world's biodiversity still existed. Uh, but uh, many ecosystems are, are on death row, and, and they may be alive now, but they're, they're doomed. Um, and so I imagine myself sometimes as a time traveler. I, I think of myself coming back from the post-biodiversity future to collect biodiversity we wish we'd saved. So I'm a time traveler, okay? So in my time, I'm a paleontologist. I look back 500 years and say, wouldn't it be great to go back there? And I've managed to get the funding, and I've come back. <laughs> uh, and I came back to get excellent specimens 
of what otherwise would be memories or fossils. And um, it's, it turns out that it's really hard to get the live spiders back through the customs at the other end. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm collecting uh, preserved specimens uh, and uh, uh, so that we, at least we have that. We'd be happy if we had pickled dinosaurs after all. <laughs>